Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. A great pleasure to uh, have the chance to introduce Dunya Lakmiri to, to you. And uh, Dunya is uh, some, uh, something of a veteran at uh, Gerard because she's been with us for the best part of the last 10 years. Um, she started with two undergraduate internships um, with me. And I think, I think back in 2012 or so, um, then Dunya did her uh, master's at Gerard also with me. And she started working on topics related to uh, derivative free optimization. Um, she moved on to, to do her PhD under the guidance of uh, Sebastiano Di Gabel, also on topics related to DFO with some connections to um, hyperparameter optimization of, uh, of uh, deep learning solvers. And uh, now she is uh, doing a postdoc with Andrea Lodi and myself, um, also on topics related to uh, deep learning. And so it's a great pleasure to have her here today. And without further ado, uh, take it away, Dunya. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. And thank you for the invitation to participate in this seminar. Um, as Dominique mentioned, I am currently working under the supervision of himself and Professor Andrea Lodi. And today I'll be presenting our ongoing research about the topic of deep network pruning that we propose to do so with the stochastic proximal uh, optimizer with non-smooth regularization. So before I dive into the heart of this subject, I just want to start with the uh, introduction with the uh, to uh, uh, show the picture of deep learning and what motivates us to look into network pruning. So deep learning, as some of you uh, may be familiar with, is, uh, uh, is a field that has been very active for, I'd say, the better part of the last two decades. Um, it has tackled a variety of problems and it has many applications. Uh, one of maybe the first ones that we can remember is the hand the written digit recognition that we can see with the MNIST data sets. And then deep learning moved on to more complex uh, applications such as computer vision when we talk about uh, classifying uh, images or doing some uh, image segmentation, as I am showing in this picture. Uh, second, we can think of application in anomaly detection. This is when we want to be able to separate a small number of data anomalous behavior from a large number of uh, normal and uh, data. We can think about applications, for example, in cybersecurity, when uh, the goal is to be able to detect, hopefully, the very few breaches that may happen in the network. Next, uh, deep learning has been, I'd say, driven very much by uh, reinforcement learning and natural language processing in the past years. Here I'm including a picture of, uh, of an experiment that was published by OpenAI last year. And uh, I think the video is still available on YouTube. You can see the evolution of uh, these agents that were trained to learn to play hide and seek. So the agents uh, learn for uh, a good amount of runs in the beginning, and then you can see them actually learn the rules of the game and learn to uh, develop strategies, collaborate between them, and even use their surroundings and so on. It's a very interesting evolution to watch. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there, we also have applications in natural language processing, and this has been driven uh, much of the big networks that we are seeing these days. Uh, here we can think of application in uh, translation or in da data retrieval or in uh, analyzing the sentiments uh, from texts and so on. And of course, there are many more applications related to deep learning. And the goal here is not really to go through all of them. I just wanted to paint the picture of uh, evolution in a field uh, that is tackling more complex uh, tasks as we go on. And this actually shows in the networks that has been proposed in the recent years. So if we look at the networks that we are observing so far, especially the ones that manage to push the state of the arts in different fields, uh, we can actually observe that their size is getting bigger as we go on uh, in this graph where, I'm, where we can see the number of parameters of these uh, networks. We can almost think, see that the, their size is following an exponential growth. 
As an example, just last year, OpenAI uh, introduced GPT-3, which at the time was considered to be one of the biggest structures. It has 175 billion parameters. And now, less than a year later, we are already almost 10 times that, which switch C that has pushed the barrier of uh, 1.5 trillion parameters. This is obviously an issue, not only because of their size, but these networks require a huge amount of resources to be trained and manipulated and, or even stored. Uh, I believe the G shard uh, network requires eight tera just to store the weights once they have been trained. And this also comes with a high costs. Uh, as an example, we can look at into OpenAI GPT-3, which was estimated to have costs around $12 million to train. And this year, Microsoft and NVIDIA shared the, the cost of training one, uh, again, big structures, which was around $85 million. And besides the uh, monetary costs of handling these structures, it also seems to be going against another trend, which is the fact that we are currently living in a, in a world with more and more IoT devices. And these devices, of course, have very strict uh, restrictions on the size and on the resources that can be deployed on them. Nonetheless, we still need to be able to deploy some intelligent application on very small devices. So this prompts the question that we are going to focus on in this talk, which is how can we find smaller network without losing the efficiency of a bigger structure? And this has been a question that uh, has drawn the attention of researcher for uh, a few years now, and we have uh, different avenues that we can uh, that we can go to. The first one, uh, I believe, was using model compression. This is when we are only thinking about the architecture of the network. So we are trying to create smaller architectures. Uh, we can also think about uh, tensor factorization. And this is because in the neural network, most of the uh, operations are actually matrix multiplications. So therefore, if we can factorize this uh, multiplication, we can obtain a smaller structure. The third avenue is pruning and sparsification. And this is the one that this talk focuses on. So I'm going to come back later to really uh, go into the details of what we mean by pruning and sparsification. And before that, I'm just going to mention that we also have uh, quantization, which is also another way of creating small and uh, networks with less latency, for example. So let's look into pruning uh, in more details. What do we mean by neural network pruning? Um, one uh, very coarse definition of network pruning would be the fact uh, that we are removing some components of the network. For example, in this image, we are starting from a fully connected network on the left, and then we want to retrieve a sparse architecture, a sparse structure, either by removing some weights or by removing some neurons, for example. And of course, as you can see, if we remove a neuron, we are automatically removing all the weights that are connected to it and from it. This also can create some issues. Some, we still have to maintain a flow, meaning that we have to maintain a connected structure. We need to be able to propagate an information from the input to the output of the network. There has been in the literature a wide variety of network pruning algorithms. But at the heart of each one of them, uh, I believe lies the answer of four different questions. The first one would be, what do we prune? Meaning, what type of structure are we targeting? The smallest structure is uh, targeting the weights. And this will be done by disconnecting individual, individual weights uh, as we go on. Secondly, as the pictures before uh, showed, we can also remove neurons. Or we can think about removing channels, for example, in the case of convolutional neural networks. And I've also seen papers that suggest that we could remove layers altogether. And as I mentioned before, again, this will need some management because we will have to decide how do we connect the previous layer to the next layer. So in order to keep a connected graph at the end. The second question would be, when do we apply our pruning? And once again, we have different options. The first one being the one-shot pruning, meaning that we start by pruning a full structure and then we train directly, once and for all, the uh, sparse architecture. Other papers suggest that we can actually start by training our network and then prune at the very, very early stages. 
uh, I have seen papers suggest that we can prune uh, as low as three to, to five epochs and st still manage to retrieve a good sparse architecture with, that has uh, good scores at the end. Uh, I'd say the most popular scheme though is uh, pruning at the end of the training because then we want to exploit uh, the knowledge that was acquired during the training of a neural network. Thirdly is the how, and by this I mean, once we have decided on what structure do we prune and when, how can we differentiate between the good structures, the good weights, for example, to keep and which ones do we, uh, can we discard? So this is the phase where we have to develop a criteria to differentiate between our different structures. And for this, we can either have criteria that are only based on the architecture itself, and this is what we mean by data-free uh, pruning, or on the contrary, we can develop uh, criteria that are customized to a specific data set. The third option would be to uh, have criteria that are based on what we observe during the training. And typically this is the criteria that will use the gradient and the flow of the gradient during the training, for example. Finally, uh, the question of how much, uh, how much can we uh, sparsify our structure? Uh, it is either up to us to specific to decide beforehand on the sparsification target that we want, or we can first remove uh, all the uh, uh, the components that we want to remove based on our criteria, and then assess uh, the sparsity that we obtain at the end. Knowing that generally we consider that a 70 to 90 percent sparsity is considered a moderate sparsity, and we only talk about high sparsity when we are above 99 percent. Uh, for the interested, I uh, recommend the paper of Hoffler and Thorsten. They gave a very thorough literature review of all the pruning algorithms uh, in the literature as of now. But as for us, the proposed method that I will be presenting today, it targets the uh, weights as the structure. This is what we call unstructured, unstructured pruning, actually. And we do that at the end of the training because our training cr criteria is based on the training itself. And uh, I will go more into the de details of our training uh, algorithm later. Uh, so far, our early tests show that we are within the moderate spars sparsity range. Most of our results are above 85% to 90% sparsity. So I have mentioned uh, we are going to base our pruning on the training itself. So if we consider the training of a neural network, here I'm going to use the notation that x is the vector of parameters and f of x and c is the stochastic loss function. Uh, it is stochastic because each time we are assessing the loss function on a mini batch sample. And this could represent a binary cross entropy if we are doing classification or mean squared error or any other loss function that is used in the context of deep learning. And we also consider a regularization function uh, more specifically, we can also admit non-smooth regularization function, which is not a standard practice, I'd say, in deep learning, uh, at least not in the libraries that we have available. So meaning that when we train a deep neural network, this is equivalent to solving an optimization problem that can be written as minimizing the loss function, the expectation of the loss function, plus the regularization function. Uh, for the practitioners, we are used uh, to using the L2 norm as a regularization function, as it has been shown to avoid overfitting. This type of optimization uh, method, uh, I'm sorry, this type of optimization problem, as it has been written here, uh, we know in the literature of optimization that we have some specific methods that are tailored for this type of uh, objectives that can be written as the sum of two components. Uh, I will be focusing on the proximal gradient uh, algorithms. And to uh, introduce them, I will first consider the deterministic case. So here we have an objective function that is the sum of two components. F is our loss function that is deterministic now. It is supposed to be L smooth, meaning that it is differentiable and the uh, gradient of F is L Lipschitz. And we also assume that R, uh, R the uh, regularization function, is proper and lower semi-continuous. So as I said, the proximal gradient method is an algorithm that can 
can be used to optimize this objective. It is it has some similarities to the classical gradient descent that we know, in the sense that at each iteration, we are going to follow the gradient of f, but then we have to take into account the fact that we have a regularization term in our objective. So let's start with an initial point. At each iteration, as I said, we will follow the gradients. So we have to decide on the step size. And then we take our next iterate to be a minimum of the subproblem that I've stated here. And this subproblem can be written using the proximal operator. So it is the proximal operator uh, reg uh, with regards to our regularization of x minus alpha gradient of f. And this term reminds us of the classical gradient descent algorithm. In fact, if we didn't have a regularization in our function, this would be the classical gradient descent that we are used to. Now, what's interesting with this proximal operator is that we have two uh, important results. The first one is that if for some uh, expressions of R, we actually have a closed form solution for uh, this proximal uh, operator. Uh, the second important thing to notice is that uh, we have a guarantee of decrease on the overall objective if we manage to take the step size to be lower than one over L and L being the Lipschitz constants uh, of the gradient of f. Now, bear in mind that we want to apply a variant of this algorithm to our deep learning uh, training. And in that case, and actually in a lot of general cases, we don't know the value of this Lipschitz constant beforehand. And we can try to bypass that either by you doing a line search to along our search direction, or as I have seen in some papers, especially ProxSGD and ProxGen, which I will come back to in a, in a couple of slides, we can take the assumption that our initial step size validates our assumption, and then we can manage to generate only decreasing values of step sizes. <clears throat> our third option would be, for example, to use a quadratic regularization, and this is what I will be focusing on. Uh, this is what I will be presenting still in the deterministic case. So let's consider the algorithm named R2 that was proposed by uh, Aravkin, Baraldi, and Urban. <clears throat> Still in the deterministic case, we consider a local linear approximation of f that will allow us to uh, define a local model. This model will be used to compute the next step. And our step is taken as a minimizer of our model, which can be rewritten again as a proximal uh, operator of minus one over sigma uh, gradient of f. And once again, for some specific Rs, we do have the exact solution of this subproblem. Now, because S is a minimizer of the model and not of the objective function itself, we still have to uh, verify the actual decrease and compare it with the decrease of our model. And this is done by computing a ratio, rho, I'm sorry, uh, where we compare the decrease of the objective function compared to the decrease of the model. And then based on the value of rho, we would either decide to accept the step and uh, we will have to update also the penalty function, the penalty term in our model. So this is summarized in this algorithm. As I mentioned, the value of road uh, decides whether we accept the step or not. And then we can either decide to increase decrease sigma or maintain it at a similar level as the previous step. Now here's an example of running R2 on a basis pursuit denoise problem. This is a problem where uh, our goal is to retrieve a sparse signal from uh, noisy observations. And this is done by minimizing this uh, problem that looks like a mean squared error problem plus a regularization term. So we run this algorithm R2 for this example, taking n uh, to be 512 and m to be 200. And we have observed that we have uh, uh, a fast convergence, actually. Uh, we converge in le less than 60 iterations. And at the end, we managed to retrieve a sparse signal that almost exactly coincides with the true uh, uh, signal initially. So here, the two curves are uh, identical to the point that we don't really see the blue curve that lies behind the red one. So this is for the uh, deterministic case. Let's see now how we can extend this R2 method to the stochastic setting. So as I mentioned, the stochasticity, the stochasticity of our objective function comes from the fact that we evaluate f, the loss function, with mini-batch samples. 
which means that we don't really have access to the full gradient of F, but we only have access to stochastic gradients. And each stochastic gradient is associated with a mini batch. So we are going to deploy the same uh, steps of R2, but on each mini batch. And we are going to replace the gradient of F with the stochastic gradient that I've denoted here with JT. So once again, we have a local approximation of F, a local model uh, that where we compute our step and then we decide whether to take that step or not based on the ratio rho that compares the actual decrease versus the decrease of the model. And this is the variant that I will be using for, to show the tests uh, at the end of this presentation. I will be comparing myself against uh, two methods, these, uh, that prox SGD and prox gen, which are also proximal methods that are uh, applied to training deep neural networks. The, one of the main uh, difference between prox SGD, prox gen, and our method SR2, first of all, is the fact that these two methods do not use the stochastic gradient directly. Uh, they use a stochastic gradient with momentum. This is why we have to introduce the momentum coefficient. And at each iteration, at each batch, we need to compute the direction with momentum. Secondly, they can also handle uh, adding a preconditioner to our gradients. And at each iteration, they take the next step as being the solution of a proximal subproblem. Uh, again, this looks like uh, the, uh, the proximal expression that I have shown before, where we have x minus a certain uh, coefficient uh, multiplied by the search direction. Again, here this highlights another difference between these two methods and SR2. Uh, in SR2, we compute first the step and then we decide whether we accept it or not. These two methods always accept the step because they are, come up with the, the next iteration directly as being the solution of the proximal subproblem. Still, they do have some differences between the two. Uh, the first one is that ProxyGT technically is not an exact proximal optimization method because they don't solve exactly this subproblem. They uh, split it into two stages. The first one, has an expression that looks similar to the first one, except that we don't have a learning rate in this subproblem. The learning rate is added at the, another stage. Contrary to ProxGen that solves directly the subproblem, so it is an exact proximal method. And actually ProxGen uh, is a very general uh, framework for proximal methods in the sense that it is uh, depending on the, the parameters that we choose, we can either generate, for example, an exact prox SGD, an exact prox ADAM, or uh, an exact proximal version of uh, some optimizers that we are used to using. So there are many variants that we can create with ProxGen. So now let's look into uh, the intermediate, the first results that we get with training some networks with, uh, for example, here we start with the L1 norm as a regularization on SciPar 10. I am using ProxGen uh, as uh, the proximal atom, Prox SGD as it, it was uh, given in the paper, and SR2 that I've just presented. I want to stress that these are only uh, preliminary results in the sense that we are not focusing on getting to, uh, high accuracies as of yet. Uh, so don't be alarmed if you see low uh, test accuracies right now compared to the state of the arts. We are mainly focused on observing the magnitudes of the weights once they have been trained with one of these optimizers. So first thing we can observe here is that for all three methods, we managed to uh, drive most of the ways to lower magnitudes. We uh, all, almost always have more than 90% uh, of weights that are smaller to 10 to the minus six with Prox SGD that is uh, a top performer in this regard. And uh, surprisingly, however, SR2 manages to drive almost all of those ways to be exactly zero, which is very different from the two other methods. So this means technically that if we remove all of these weights that are exactly zero, we should not see any drop of accuracy in our, in our network. And this is actually the, the way we do our pruning. So at each time we will decide on a threshold and we will remove all the weights with the magnitude that, that is lower to that threshold. And then we will observe uh, the accuracy that we still retain in our network. For example, here we have tested some threshold varying from 10 to the minus six to 10 to the minus one. 
And it is interesting to see that all three optimizers uh, allow to maintain the original accuracy up to 10 to the minus three. And then we can observe a sharp decrease for 10 to the minus two and 10 to the minus one. If we look at the sparsity that is equivalent to 10 to the minus three, we see that all three networks have a sparsity of above 98% at, uh, at this, uh, with this threshold. So this means that at 98% sparsity, we have exactly the same test accuracy as the original network. And so far, I am not doing any retraining. So this is only pruning and then assessing directly the accuracy that remains. We do a similar test on ResNet 34, which is a slightly bigger network. This time it has uh, uh, 21 million parameters. And once again, we see similar tendencies in the sense that Prox SGD is the one that drives most of the weights to small uh, magnitudes. And SR2 seems to be driving still a lot of the weights to values that are exactly zero. Again, same uh, pruning strategy. 10 to the minus three seems to be a good threshold to maintain the original accuracy. And SR2 uh, even has a slight increase in that case. And when we look at the sparsity, we are above 97% sparsity for all three methods, despite uh, Prox SGD and ProxGen having uh, a slightly, not slightly, but significantly more uh, sparsity in that case. Now, looking at uh, the same tests, meaning uh, the same networks, but this time with the L0 norm. Uh, again, we start with DenseNet 1 to 1, uh, 8 million parameters. The first thing that we have observed is, well, let me just say that we have kept the same uh, hyperparameters for the two tests. And we have observed a sharp decrease in accuracy when using the L0 norm, except for SR2. Uh, however, when we look at the sparsity and uh, the magnitude of the weights, Prox HDD seems to be behaving similarly to the L1 norm, but we see a, a big difference for uh, Prox HGN and SR2. SR2 has uh, once again the highest number of weights that are exactly zero, but this is still considerably lower than what we have observed with the L1 norm. And this can be uh, again visible with the pruning and uh, sparsity graphs. Uh, it is interesting to observe here that this time 10 to the minus 2 seems to be a, a good threshold for both SR2 and ProxGen. ProxSGD follows the same tendencies as before. And finally, for ResNet 34, again with L0 norm, uh, similar observations, drop in accuracy for ProxSGD and ProxGen, SR2 seems to be having the highest number of ways to be exactly zero. And as I mentioned, these are still preliminary results. We think that we can increase these scores. Uh, here's an example of just in increasing the lambda term that is associated to the regularization. Just by increasing the lambda, not changing anything else in the training, we observe that the sparsity jumps actually for SR2. And I suspect that we can do similar things for both ProxGen and ProxHGD to adjust for the L0 norm. Uh, again, SR2 seems to be uh, holding its accuracy up to 10 to the minus 2, uh, contrary to ProxSGN and ProxSGD. And it also has a higher sparsity level, not compared to ProxSGD, uh, Prox but again, ProxSGD is the network that has the lowest accuracy in this case. So this is for the implementation parts of our project. The other part is the fact that we uh, want to prove some convergence properties for SR2. Uh, and uh, then again, we are still comparing ourselves to SPROX HDD and PROX GEN, which both uh, have some convergence properties. For PROX HDD, we have an asymptotic convergence result that states that the limit point of the sequence of iterates that we generate will be a stationary point with probability one. ProxGen has uh, stronger uh, I'd say convergence properties in the sense that they bring a non-asymptotic result. Uh, I am presenting here only the version with the fixed batch size uh, to uh, have uh, a smaller formula, but they also have a similar result for any type of batch sizes. So they managed to bound the distance between the vector zero and the Frechy subdifferential of the overall uh, objective function. So here they state that the expectation of that distance squared is lower than one over t, uh, t being the number of epochs that we do during our training. So this means that if we want to have a distance that is lower than 
uh, error uh, epsilon, we need to be taking epsilon to the minus two epochs. Each epoch, of course, will have a certain number of batch sizes, meaning that we still have a number of uh, pro, uh, stochastic gradients to evaluate. And their final result states that if we want the distance to be lower than epsilon, then we need a complexity of epsilon to the minus four. Uh, so far, we are still working for us in on our convergence properties. So we are still building uh, the different components that we will be using for our results, which is why it is still in its uh, early stages. And I decided not to include it in this talk today. Which means that all in all, we are working on a new proximal solver uh, that is different from the ones currently uh, available in the sense that, first of all, we do not have any assumption on the Lipschitz constant, contrary to the two methods that I've been discussing. And our preliminary results show that we have a good sparsity so far. We, can, uh, we are hitting the 85% to 90% targets without any loss of accuracy. And here I, I remind you that I am still not doing any retraining which means that technically we could hope to get a higher sparsity and retrieve uh, the original accuracy if we push uh, the, the, the pruning even further and retraining at the end. Of course, we still have to test our method SR2 on a variety of, of tests. Uh, I mean, by adding more networks, more data sets, and also by including other regularizers such as the semi-norms, which also have a closed form solution for their proximal subproblem. So I'll leave you with the references that I've been using for this presentation, and I thank you all. <laughs>